are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. Here I interview brain scientists and discuss their work as well as the latest advances and challenges in the entire field of brain mapping. Today I'm talking with Dr. Scott Merrick, Brendan Turville Clemens, Damian Fair, and Nico Dosenpach, who are among the co-authors of the recently published paper in Nature titled, Reproducible Brain-Wide Association Studies Require Thousands of Individuals. This is an extremely well done study on several large data sets that demonstrates that to make reproducible associations between MRI measures, both structural and functional, and behavioral measures, upwards of 2,000 subjects are required. The reason for the strong reaction across the field to this paper is likely because it's well known that the fMRI signal is extremely strong and robust, producing useful single subject results or small number of subject results that inform us on brain activity associated at the individual level with learning, habituation, plasticity, and other behaviors. Why is the effect size essentially three orders of magnitude smaller when trying to pull out differences between subjects as it relates to their behavioral measures? This isn't really an fMRI problem, but rather a revelation of the subtleties and variabilities of behavior-related neural correlates between subjects. In this insightful, clarifying, and ultimately optimistic conversation about fMRI and the implications of this paper, we talk about all the issues surrounding these results. We go over possible reasons for these extremely small effects and discuss all the ways forward. So hopefully uh, it will be helpful to all of you. It's extremely helpful to me and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming on to the OHBM Neuroscience podcast. Uh, Scott Merrick, Brendan Turville Clemens, Damien Fair, and Nico Dosenbach. The topic of this podcast is all about this, this paper that uh, came out recently called Reproducible Brainwide Association Studies Require Thousands of Individuals, published in Nature. It caused quite a stir, most of it positive, some of it reacting to the title, some of it reacting to the reactions to the title. And I think actually, if, if anything, it was sort of a, a nice sort of placement of where the field is for people who care about doing this type of thing. So before we start, why don't we just have uh, you introduce yourselves, maybe starting with Scott. All right. So yeah, I'm Scott Merrick. I am an instructor in the psychiatry department at Washington University. School of Medicine in St. Louis. I'm Brendan Turbo Clemens. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School in Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm Damien Fair. I'm a professor in the Institute of Child Development, professor in pediatrics in the School of Medicine, and also the um, relief director of the Masonic Institute of the Developing Brain here at the University of Minnesota. Um, Nico Dosenbach. I'm at Wash U School of Medicine, St. Louis, Associate Professor in the Neurology Department. And, and it's also quite a large author list. Uh, we might get into that. I mean, obviously, you used a lot of the, the large data sets and so required a lot of people. But, um, but it's great that, you're, that the four of you are here uh, on this. So just to start out, and I know that there have been papers along these lines, but this one actually very clearly states the problem of how many individuals you actually require to do a very specific type of fMRI. And that is uh, drawing inferences, which you call brain-wide association across behavioral measures. So what motivated the study to begin with? What, what made you think, okay, we have to do this better than what, it's, what has been done before? It really all started back in around January of 2019. It just sounds like so long ago now. <laughs> um, it was a, a paper that we were invited to write for uh, DCN and developmental cognitive neuroscience. And at the time we had, you know, started to, to collect some ABCD data. And so the thing that, that 
I was really interested in. Well, really, both Brendan and I, whenever I, there's a question that comes up, I always think, oh, I'm going to give Brendan a call and we'll talk about ideas. So, you know, I was invited to write this, gave him a call and remember walking outside and, you know, we were spitballing ideas and sort of came up with, you know, we, you know, at the time we had 2000 subjects worth of data. And so it was, you know, let's just give the definitive answer. What is the, the cognitive architecture of the, the child brain? And, you know, just sort of put that out there and assuming that, you know, given the literature, 2000 people would be plenty to show some nice reproducible results. Um, and it turned out after a few months worth of work that that wasn't the case. And that, you know, at, at first I just, there's like no way, like we had to do something wrong. I was checking code, triple checking code, quadruple checking code, um, you know, and it, and it just was the case that, that those effect sizes were uniformly smaller than we thought they were going to be. And they didn't reproduce very well. Um, and now I'll punt it over to Brennan because he was the brains behind saying, hey, why don't you subsample the data and see what happens? So take it away, Brendan. Yeah, and, and, I, and I appreciate, uh, Peter, your comments. In, in some ways, I wanna make sure to acknowledge that even in this call, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and this paper is obviously standing on the shoulder of giants. And um, so I think Scott and I have benefited from being sort of the first cohort of graduate students and now postdocs in the era of big data and neuroimaging. Um, and so part of that for me has been a lot of quantitative and statistical training. Um, and so what, what happened was that we saw the effect size early on in, in linking these, these cross section in these cross sectional linkages between uh, resting state and cortical thickness and these psychological phenotypes. And then being familiar with some of the papers you alluded to, um, excellent work by Button, um, you know, fantastic classic psychometric work um, in the field kind of from my training sort of quickly understood the, the, the potential implications, which is that these small effect sizes could broadly spent, uh, explain a lot of uh, irreproducible results um, that I myself, and perhaps more than many on this call, as someone that's interested in clinical neuroscience and psychiatry, had spent much of my graduate career trying to reproduce and trying to go after. Um, so it was a, a, a wonderful turn of events that this large data allowed us to kind of more comprehensively answer these questions that had been posed by, you know, Tal Yarconi uh, almost a decade before um, in, other, in other places. Okay, okay. Um, so do you want to, maybe before we uh, get into some of the details and, and some of the implications and some of my own thoughts or, and then questions about you, about, you know, what could be done, uh, do you want to just sort of summarize uh, uh, not you know the the nitty gritty details, but just maybe summarize the what you did and uh, and generally what you found as far as that's concerned. Just to to all the listeners who haven't read the paper, <laughs> uh, will know who who wants to do this. Maybe Scott, and then you know you can chime in wherever. Yeah, it was uh, basically running as many associations as we could, as computers would allow us to do in a short period of time. So you know, subsampling data. So we have these full data sets, which, you know, across the UK Biobank, the ABCD data set and HCP, we had around 50,000 individuals. So it was, you know, subsampling that data down and then running a bunch of simulated studies, essentially, uh, across a whole range of, of uh, you know, brain features and behavioral phenotypes. And then from there, just, you know, summarizing the statistical properties of that, what are the effect sizes, what effect sizes could you just expect by chance at smaller ends and then quantifying, you know, statistical power and, and reproducibility at every sample size. Okay. Okay. And, and then pretty much the finding was right. That's, that's, uh, you know, looking at your figures, it seemed to imply that, that, you know, you looked at, uh, you know, cortical thickness, resting state fMRI and uh, some tasks and you did univariate and multivariate. And it seems like, uh, yeah, things don't things don't start to uh, uh, stabilize until until after over a thousand or two thousand subjects. Uh, and yeah, and I, yeah. I, I certainly think an important point is you know we are not saying that absolutely nothing can be reproduced with less than a thousand individuals. This isn't a race to the bottom. It's in general, given you know the comprehensive scope of this paper, you know you would behoove yourself to use as large of a data set as possible for reproducibility. Okay. 
And and do you, so just to start off, uh, were any of you, I mean, I, we a little bit of talked about this, but were you surprised or, you know, was the reaction uh, uh, sort of like, okay, so now what do we do? I mean, I mean, so was it surprising or was it, you know, it's interesting for me, it was, it was not really surprising because I sort of saw, you know, everyone kind of who's in, who's trying to do this sort of thing and I'm doing, I'm sort of a little bit more removed, but uh, it was sort of surprising just that the large number. Uh, <laughs> uh, I knew it took a lot of subjects, but that was, that was a little bit larger than I expected. And um, was this surprising to you or do you still feel there's something about this that, that, uh, well, we, we'll get into talking about improvements, but anyway, was it surprising to you in any sort of way? <laughs> I would say that the biggest surprise for me was th these figures that Scott and Brendan generated for this DCN paper. And the big disconnect was that if you do a group average matrix, you know, functional connectivity, whatever it is, seed map or we like info map, you know, uh, get the networks out and you do another group, you, you, Scott and Brendan will know exactly, but you get to like a correspondence of 0.99 like very quickly. And you get to a nice correspondence, which is like 20 each. Yeah. Uh, so so fMRI is awesome. It works, it reproduces. And the big disconnect is like, but when you try to relate it to these phenotypes, and then you look at the matrices comparing, you know, the brain data to the behavioral data, they don't replicate all that good at a thousand. And it's sort of like that was to me, I mean, that's like. Yep. I think most yeah. people, the first time they saw it, that's like the hard thing to wrap your head around. You're like, yep. why is the correlation so different when the imaging data is so good? And, you know, having talked to a bunch of reporters and stuff, I, nobody takes me up on it. It's like, I don't blame imaging. I blame correlations. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, imaging's <laughs> fine. Like, the imaging's not the, 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 the bad guy here. Uh, yeah. that, that took me a while. Now, I have to say, Brendan probably wasn't surprised because he was like, yeah, of course. <laughs> well, I was, I think there's a, I think, you know, I was surprised, but I'm older, right? And I think, in fact, if you if you actually if you actually look at the comments, there's like it's like a there's like a linear correlation with how upset you are based on how old you are, right? <laughs> and and the the um the, the issue is like it's surprising to me because I was trained with fMRI essentially, right? And fMRI by itself, when you're intervening a task and you have multiple repeated measures, is, has way more power, right? And so like having smaller samples is not as big an issue because the power is so much stronger. So that's how I was trained, that's how I learned. But of course, as we've, the field kind of started shifting to doing these kind of cross-correlational, cross-behavioral type of analyses, instead of dissecting the specific psychology, then the questions change, but the designs of the experiments stay the same. And so like, that includes myself. Like I was doing this, I was just kind of, you know, kind of continuing on with what I knew. And so that's why I kind of flipped the switch, you know, from that initial DCM paper, I was like, oh man, there's like, this is, this is a big problem, you know? And, and so, and so, yeah, just having that little bit of a runway, you know, helped me kind of come to grips with it. And then also try to start thinking about like, okay, well, how do you handle it? You know, and, you know, and it wasn't actually until the, the nice figures by Scott and Brennan that they said that I really, really understood the gravity of it. it. Wasn't until some of those these guys started showing me the these newer kind of analyses, and I was like, oh, that's even bigger than than that, you know. But so was, for us, it was like an easy kind of I wouldn't say easy, but it was like a, a kind of a slower shift to recognizing the error. And I think for everybody else, it's 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 a less it's, it was less slow. It was so dramatic because it came out in a paper. And then, you know, and then if you're old and you, you know, like, oh, I have all these, in fact, even our mentors are like yelling at us, you know, because they have their own schema about like how many subjects it takes. But it's, it's just different type of question, you know, than we did in the old days, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was just going to add, I, I think <laughs> Nika was saying I probably wasn't surprised. And that, that's because I am colleagues and, and speak a lot with quantitative people in epidemiology and other sort of fields where these types of designs um, are common. But I will say I was absolutely heartbroken. Um, and it, it was a scary time to, to think about how do I move forward as an early career researcher. Um, and, and Damien's comments speak well to, I think the difference is that we've had a run up of now three years of thinking about this and changing how we think about the science that we'll do. Um, so so I, I agree with that, that point that Damien made as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so for myself, so it's sort of like a form of cognitive dissonance, I think, that especially experienced by older researchers, but definitely by younger ones, too. And, and I think you're actually absolutely right. It sort of it really does depend on the question and how you actually use fMRI. And and to me, I mean, so and as I started thinking about this, I'm thinking, OK, is this so is there really like so this takes 2000 subjects, but I know for a fact that if I put a subject in there, they tap their fingers or do even higher cognitive tasks, you can see something with your eye uh, that's clearly significant within a single run. Um, and so how do you bring those, those two points together? And so it seems like the main effect, the fMRI activation is, is almost like three orders of magnitude greater in some way, uh, some measure than, than the difference that you could derive across populations uh, with behavior. Is that sort of a, a correct approximation that th the three orders of magnitude difference in some sense. Uh, do you know what I'm trying to say there? So like, for instance, yeah. Um, yeah, like one subject, one subject, you can see something and it's, and you can make a significant map of the central tendency of, of like a single, but to, to then differentiate based on a behavior measure uh, between that individual or the, you know, that behavioral measure, you need, you know, a thousand subjects or more. Um, so. Yeah, I think there's like there's multiple layers to the answer of that. Uh, one is intervening in the brain versus observing the brain. So in the type of study that you know we're talking about with BWAS, it's it's totally observational, right? Whereas you know inducing a task or like the the cast study from Nico's lab, inducing an effect by casting an arm. Exactly. You know you're you're perturbing the brain, and so when you when you poke it and make it do something, you need you know much less, many less people, right? Like in one person, for example, in the midnight scan club, like you were saying, Peter, you just have someone tap their finger a whole bunch. You can get, you know, you can localize M1 in, in one person. You don't need 2000 people to do that. So it's really then a question of, you know, observation versus intervention. There's the correlational aspect of this, right? So relating the brain to something versus observing something in the brain or perturbing the brain. Uh, and individual difference research versus group averages. So it's a it's a big difference if you want to say, oh, there's a difference between these two groups versus, you know, saying something about a given individual on that spectrum. So I think there's, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of nuance to the type of study that can be done with MRI, which, you know, the field of genetics doesn't have. So that's why we draw the parallel from BWAS to GWAS because it's that type of research where you're taking these, you know, observational cross-sectional linkages, but, you know, we can do a lot, we can do a lot of powerful things with manipulating the brain that you can't do with genetics. Uh, and that's, I think, where the nuance comes in and requires a lot of thought. And, you know, when you just see a title, it can, yeah, I can see how you like easily react to it. Um, yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean that all, it doesn't mean that all tasks have large effects, right? Or either, right. you know, right. that doesn't mean that, you know, if, but it, there is more power. It's, it, you know, within subject task at MRI is essentially a repeated measure study, you know, yeah. and it just has way more power, you know, so then, and if you think about it, you know, there's two things that I think that are important for this that I, I, I keep coming across is that, you know, for these, there is, like Scott said, you know, what the study does not mean is there's no way that you can increase the effect size for these, for these kind of cross-correlational studies. Um, you can, if you can decrease, you know, aspects of the noise and, you know, on both the, the outcome measure and the, the brain measure and there's individual differences and all types of stuff that are re re reducing the effects. Yeah. With that said, you know, there's going to be a limit. And I think that the nice thing that people are forgetting about this paper is that it also included structural MRI, right? <laughs> like people are so focused on the functional MRI for whatever reason, but it also includes structural MRI, which has a lot more, much higher reliability just in general. Um, and it is, and it was the same, if not worse in some cases. So, you know, so it's, it's not a, while we certainly can search for improved effects by decreasing the noise. And so um, it's not a holy grail likely, you know, you know, it'd be interesting to see what that peak is, but it's, I don't know if that's the, it's the holy grail. Yeah. Well, let me just, uh, yeah. And actually I'm going to, yeah, that would be, I think it's worth talking about all the potential sources 
uh, uh, variance and error and noise in the time series. But even before I do that, um, and also, right, just to, just to further emphasize that, right, I mean, you know, pre-surgical mapping, looking at habituation, hab habituation effects, looking at, you know, even using, you know, represents, representational similarity analysis uh, that, we, you know, that's only possible on single subjects, and it works pretty well. And, uh, and there's many, like you, like you do, like a lot of, all of, almost all of you do, you do, you know, sort of more single subject interventions where you, where you, you know, put a person in the cast for several weeks and see what happens. And, and, and that's all very strong effects. And that's all very, it, it works very well. Um, but what I'm wondering about this, and this is the, the, the question. So let's say this is a real effect and, 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 and maybe uh, uh, similar to, to GWAS, uh, it's useful for studying some types of, you know, large group uh, phenotypes. But then I feel, always feel that the, the purpose of these large databases is to find these biomarkers that you can then go back clinically and put people in the scanner and compare them to this template and say, ah, you, you, know, you need this treatment. And it seems like that's almost an impossible problem because once again, you're back to this single subject comparing to you know, this, this biomarker that it's obtained with 2000 subjects. Is that still, do you think, a real goal? And if not, you know, what is the goal uh, uh, of these massive data sets then? Um, I mean, I think you, <laughs> oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Just to go ahead, Brandon. I'm trying to, I'm kind of parse my words, but be very yeah. careful. Not I, think, I, think, I think part of what you're referring to is that, you know, and again, kind of to, to be clear about where I, where my training has happened in this trajectory is I think for a long time, the premise, particularly in psychiatry, and I'll, I'll make that point since Nico's on the call, uh, which is different than neurology. The premise has been largely that fMRI and MRI would be a diagnostic and screening tool and useful in that endeavor. Um, and I think if we look at GWAS, th there are elements of that that, that still, um, that, that endeavor is somewhat useful. As, as we increase these models and we reach an asymptote, we will be better able to understand an individual um, participant. I, I do agree with your point, which is that perhaps we should think more broadly in the endeavor of trying to understand mental health of whether these cross-sectional designs and whether this model of pushing always towards screening makes the most sense versus something more patient specific or in the context of an intervention, um, some of those more single subject designs that, that you mentioned. Um, so I, I agree with you that, that, that our work, in, while we didn't set out to do that, it raises those questions that I think are important for our field to grapple with. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that's been part of the issue is that we're trying to treat population studies as their biomarkers for individuals. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yes, that's yes. part of the problem. That's part of why, how we got here. Right. Yep. And so I think these large, these large data sets are, are going to be extremely useful. I mean, if we're thinking clinically, right. Over time for calculating and understanding population risk. You might look at even like population changes, like, you know, the big studies on aspirin for secondary stroke. These are things I was a part of back in the old days, right? Like that's great for trying to understand population trends because that's what it is, right? Yeah. And that's, I think, what these studies will help with. And that can be extremely valuable. We know that to be true. I just gave you a good example, right? Yeah. Um, but if we're looking for a specific biomarker, for, you know, or like in your case, like pre-surgical planning you were just talking about, or like, you know, response to a specific response to intervention or, you know, things like that, right? Then I think the designs of the studies need to be different, right? You need to design the study to do that, you know? Right. And I think that's part of why we got here is because we're trying to have, a, you know, have our cake and eat it too. So we do big study and you do like group one versus group two and you think it can be for everything, you know? Yeah. But that's just not, that's not, I don't think is the right way. And I think that the nice thing about this particular paper is that it's going to, essentially is going to force the field to think more deeply about how you're designing your study for this specific question, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that, I think that's going to be a win. I mean, I, I, in all my talks on this stuff, I talk about how you know, the, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to be in because you understand the parameters. And it, it means that we, for the things that we really care about, it's a really an opportunity to accelerate 
accelerate the the progress, right? Because now you know, now you know, like how to that it's different, you know, how to you know what the parameters are to answer that specific thing, you know. Yeah. 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 One of the things Nico and I always talk about since we're both clinicians is that in medicine, there are clinical trials and there's epidemiology and there's obviously crosstalk between those two, but those are different disciplines and those are different types of questions that are asked that way. And, and I think what our paper does is kind of firmly put the, these types of association studies towards the epidemiological, towards the GWAS, um, which I think, yeah, makes room for being really clear about the importance of, of, of the more RCT style versions of imaging and, and, and these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, actually, I really do think that that's one of the, the strong points of your paper. What it's, it's nice because it does, it's sort of for, it's sort of like a, a, a forcing to clarify our thinking about fMRI, about, about, like you said, epidemiology or, or making these other sort of clinical applications. Um, I don't know, Nico, if you wanted to mention anything about that uh, uh, regarding, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think large scale studies like the stuff that's Damon spearheading, like ABCD and HBCD, is incredibly valuable. It's kind of weird because they're throwing off all this knowledge that the study wasn't designed for. So yep. uh, you know, they're guaranteed to be amazing. And uh, Katarina Gratton, Stephen Nelson, and Evan Gordon wrote like a nice piece in Neuron. They dug up this really good example. Damon already gave one about aspirin. It's about lead and IQ, right? I'm a pediatric yes. neurologist. That's a big deal. It's actually a tiny effect, but yep. it affects everyone, lead's everywhere. So the, the society is very concerned with not letting kids eat lead. And we didn't know back in the day there was lead and paint and gasoline, right? So, so we hurt kids. And even though in any given kid, it's actually a tiny effect, tiny like effect. it thumbs up. And so, I mean, I think these big studies are, that's how we're going to find this type of stuff out. Um, and I think the, the biggest misunderstanding for this whole thing, and I think, I was a little naive, not totally, because to be honest, we had meetings with like uh, the public relations office at WashU. We we like prep, like how do we get people to not misunderstand this? I mean, you know, we had so many sort of reviewers and co-authors misunderstand stuff that we literally started a writing style that was like, here's what we're saying. Here's what we're not saying, right? Because it wasn't enough to say what we're saying. Cause, cause it's like, we didn't say that. It was, and, and I think part of it is like the title puts people sort of makes them emotional right and then it's like you're reading it's like you're forward modeling it you're not really sort of absorbing it it's hard um yeah but, but but uh you know the biggest misunderstanding i think was that people that is that people can fit fmri with bwas so this is why i changed my like profile page on twitter to fmri not equal bwas because i was like what's the simple and i just would repeat it over and over again and yeah. the reason I didn't think people would go there is because we've been doing this, all, what you're saying, like, like with the cast subjects, we would literally have this sparse design where I would like twitch my finger like this every like 10 seconds and we would see it, right? Yeah. So in yeah. my mind, it was like, that's totally different. That's not even like apples and oranges, it's like apples and oatmeal or something. Like, <laughs> but, but like, I feel like because this crew is like been on the extremes, like we do N of one and with Damien, we do N of 20,000. Yes. Not everybody is in that spot. And so I was naive about how easy it would be for people to like really strictly separate that. that, that that's what you have to do. If you conflate them, it's kind of over, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, think I think that's the biggest thing I learned. And the, 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 <clears throat> I think I gained a lot of appreciation before that I didn't have prior to this is how much nuance there is to the types of things that you can do with MRI. Uh, I did not think about study design the same way that I think about it now. But again, like I also give other people in the field a break because we've been thinking about it for three years. So it's it's been three years to sort of think about the different nuance, population versus individual specific, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of each one and how we should apply them to the brain. So uh, I'm optimistic going forward that we're going to get there. Yeah. 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 I mean, the risk on that front, though, it's funny. And I've been talking about this a lot too. The risk on that is people are, essentially overfitting in their brain that this is just an fMRI thing, you know, mm. that somehow this thing is compartmentalizing the problem just to this one thing, you know, um, which is to Nico's point, right? fMRI does not equal BWAS, right? It's not just fMRI, it's all of our measures, you know, it's the same problem, right? So, you know, that's, that's part of the risk, I think, of 
this paper being done by us to primarily fMRI people, even though it's half of it is structural, is that the, the, the perception is overfit to be just fMRI. But I think it's yeah, and, for, the, and, for the audience here and everything, it's not, you got to be very careful not to do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was the reason why what because one of the co-authors asked and we put it in there it's, it's the reason why there's a supplemental figure i think it's maybe supplemental figure six that has sampling variability <laughs> of just the behavioral phenotypes with each other right to show that this isn't a brain thing this is a feature of correlational analyses not brain analyses yeah yeah it's a, it's a huge issue everywhere on, on multi-method agreement if you look at even a construct that we think is somewhat real amongst the gamut of psychological and psychiatric things like impulsivity. If you look at even the correlation between self-report measures of that and parent report measures of that and sort of objective lab-based cognitive testing, those things correlate at very low levels. And you could sort of do another paper version, version of this paper just looking at those. And so I think it, it behooves us as imaging has gained this big big data and has, is able to kind of start veering towards and arching towards epidemiological type questions. They're going to look at other fields and know that we're not alone in, in these issues as well. Yeah, but do you think also it, it, it illustrates, so let's let's maybe get into some of the potential uh, maybe confounds or, or things that are worth studying further. Um, like for instance, uh, um, yeah, like it, first, first of all, I mean, first uh, uh, just looking at the difference between um, uh, BWAS and GWAS. I mean, GWAS is sort of like a, a digital measure. BWAS is is sort of like you're measuring and 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 uh, well, let me just back up a second. Let's start with the population since we were talking about that. Um, uh, one one thing that people say to me about this paper when they when they come to me and say, well, maybe uh, you know the phenotypes were a little bit too crude, and maybe you know it's a, a one dimensional and uh, uh, maybe if you really finally started to dissect the phenotypes and group them more carefully, and it looks like you did this, you'd really try to do this really well, but maybe there'd be less variation. Um, you know, that's that's one thought that 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 it sort of illustrates how maybe we don't understand and we don't characterize phenotypes as well as we could. Um, I, Absolutely. I yeah. Absolutely. I think we need to measure behavior better. I, actually, if I was going to do finger pointing, it would be correlations, then behavior, then imaging, right? right? And I, I mean, for example, and I get in trouble about this, like the CBCL, right? Like, I, I like filled it out about my daughter for one of our studies. And I was like, oh my God, like, I'm not even sure there would be that much. You know, it's, it's like this idea that like, like, literally I was like, Imagining as somebody asking my mom about me, <laughs> what that would turn out to be. And it's like, that's what we're correlating again. Like it's so remote and like abstract. And, and, and I was like, like I, I, I can't, you still can't do it. When you write a grant, you have to put the CBCL in there. But, but I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the day when you don't have to anymore. Cause, cause I like, I'm like, I, I'm not convinced it's super useful, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to measure behavior better. Well, at least against biology, you know, you know, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I completely, of course, right. That we're going to, you're, we're, we can improve on the measurements like that, you know, effort, but MRI behavior, of course. Right. The question is like, well, what is that going to buy you? Do you know what I mean? Yep. You definitely can get it better, but I think what's unknown is I don't think what I hear, I mean, this is an opinion. I don't have any empirical evidence. I'm sure Brennan has probably thought about this and probably has like <laughs> out of his back pocket all the analysis that shows it or something. I don't know. But my guess is that you're not going to triple, quadruple the effect sizes or something because you've now got a, a better, more reliable measure, right? Yeah. It's just not going to happen. And you could, like I said, I think that you can really, you can really see that in the paper by looking at the structural data, right? Because it's way more reliable and, but it has, it, it doesn't really change much, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah and so I you, think, yeah, go on, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, so you you have your theoretical upper limit, right? Like we have the, the supplemental figure, extended data figure in the paper, you know, with the, you know, showing the attenuation of correlation. If we had perfect reliability, how high it could be. And, and that's theoretical. There's also likely an upper biological limit to, to what it would be. We don't know if those two things are the same, maybe not. I mean, the brain is incredibly complex and a lot of these phenotypes are incredibly complex. 
and humans are incredibly diverse and complex. So, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's less crazy to think that an association between two complex phenotypes would be closer to 0.1 than 0.5. Yeah, I think also when we have these conversations, it's important to distinguish between reliability, like how well it measures the brain stuff that we hope it measures or how well it measures, right, or how, how correlated it is with itself over time and validity. Um, and so this idea of perhaps we're not measuring the right things in, in behavior or, or in the brain, um, I'm kind of partial to, to maybe I'm a little bit defensive as, as at least partially a psychologist to be somewhat defensive of, of behavior. Um, so I, I'm the most, of all the, the sort of criticisms, I agree with this one the most, that, that perhaps we aren't measuring the right things. I think often though, when people say that, th their solutions in that, in that space tend to, again towards different study designs and tend towards things like dense phenotyping and longitudinal designs where we're measuring the same phenotype with passive sensing or, or EMA over many, many weeks and months and we're scanning people again. Um, and so I think um, it, it, I'm the most sort of optimistic about uh, tackling the validity question that, that gets us out of this epidemiological, large scale cross, cross sectional approach. Cause I, I agree with Damien, I think that, that how much will that buy us in these studies? Again, if we look at lead and IQ as an example, that's a really small effect. So even if we measured IQ slightly differently maybe we can push that around um, but I think often what we want when we say we're not measuring the right stuff is, is, is as much about study design as it is about what are the specific behavioral phenotypes. Yeah. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing. It's like, well, you know, small, because I, I think like we're, there's this weird training or there's this weird concept, you know, that small effects are not meaningful, right? Like, you know, or why do we care if it's a small effect? You know, that's kind of like, there's this thing, you know, that people just say oh, it's a cup because it's, it's like a talking point, you know? Yeah. And like Nico just gave a great example and I was giving one too. It's like, no, that that's these small, some small effects can be extremely meaningful, yeah. you know? And sometimes if you combine a bunch of small effects, you have way more better explanation. Sometimes there doesn't exist a large effect. So if you're only looking for large effects, you're going to find one and it's going to be wrong, right? So I think it's like, you got to change the culture a little bit on, on this topic, you know? Yeah, and, and right, I mean, in this particular case, for this particular purpose, right, these effects might, like you're saying with, with lead, that's a perfect example, or even, you know, clinically, like, you know, blood pressure. I mean, it's, a, you know, if you average populations and, and to correlate the probability of having a, a problem later, it's, you know, it's a very small change in blood, blood pressure that's not, you know, and then every individual, though, you know, sort of uses that potentially as an indicator. And so, yeah, there's many things uh, there's, uh, that still might come from this. I'm sure there's many things that might come from this um, as far as that's concerned. And, and I think it might actually inform, uh, uh, you know, and, and motivate the field to sort of come up with better behavioral measures. But I agree with you. I think that we're still, I, you know, back to the initial point of what causes people this reaction. You know, there's over the years, all the scientists, you know, look at an effect, they, 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 they see something, they average, they, they see some, something that's pretty clear. And uh, they just can't connect the fact that, that it doesn't seem to, uh, that, that these effects are so subtle. Uh, you, you imagine like, for instance, um, uh, and I think that they're all doing sort of, they're all thinking in terms of things like interventions, like for instance, with uh, skill acquisition or, or things like that. You actually see real, you actually can with few few measures see effects in the brain. You think, okay, well, mm -hmm. now that person's like a different person who's more skilled than he was mm -hmm. before. And we can see that pretty clearly. Why can't we see, why can't we take a bunch of people that are more skilled and take a bunch of people that are less skilled? And why does that take 3000 people or 2000 people? And so it's, it's, I think people are still getting their heads around this uh, and it's a complicated question. Um, I honestly think it's sort of a Kahneman and Tversky kind of thing because this has happened across fields. Like we got to talking with more GWAS researchers and they were all like, what, what? you're still talking about this? Like we did this 12 <laughs> years ago, but like they went through the same thing. So it's like, it's almost this like weird collective blindness because I had the same response. It's, it's like, a, I literally think our mind is just not really designed to to think in those large in those terms, right? We sort of like example, small bound, like everything's heuristics, right? And so it's like if you're just guessing at it and you don't do the math, 
all the smart people are wrong, <laughs> you know, like, like, <laughs> you know, like, and I'm not even calling myself smart, but like, and it's on, it's, it's this weird thing where like the statisticians that have like done the math. Yeah. They're like, of course. Right. And then yeah. everybody else who's just sort of using their heuristics is like, yeah. that can't possibly be true because it feels wrong. You know? Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> so it, it's that's, that's right. fascinating. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's a paradox, you know, I mean, because again, it's, this goes back to the culture, you know, is that, you know, P of 0.05 wins, right? So in many cases, if you're underpowered, the only way you can get that is if you're getting a massive fake effect. So then because that's how you get grants, that's how you get papers, then you just keep, and then you build your own kind of schema of like what is real. And then, so then something like this hits, of course, it breaks that whole thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, and that's hard to, it's hard to wrap your head around if you're already kind of locked into this other world, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why we called it the paradox. And it, I'm, I'm honest, it took me a while to really get it, right? It, it is, is that like, if your sample's too small, which they always used to be too small, the biggest, most statistically significant effects are the wrongest. Right? But that's sort of like, if you don't think about it for a long time, yep. you're like, what? You're crazy. No, no. <laughs> a tiny p-value and a big effect, that's your gay. We won, you know? And, and, and Brendan's and, laughing. He's like, the wrongest? Can you think of another, <laughs> can you think of another term? Um, <laughs> I live in the Midwest. <laughs> Brendan's been at Harvard. He got all the fancy words. Yeah, Nico's uh, from a village in Germany, so we'll give him a <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's ex that's exactly right. And so, right, people, you know, human nature is to do p hacking and and sort of bias sampling of of what you in looking for your results. And you find them, and that clearly, right, your your analysis of that was 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 perfect as far as that's concerned. Um, I I do want to go back. So so it's interesting as I thought about all the things that I'm like, oh, there must be something wrong. Um, and and it's my own right, getting my head around it myself. Uh, uh, and, and also bringing it back to, to the comparison with GWAS. So I thought initially, okay, so, you know, and this is something I struggle with as well. And even with, uh, you know, I remember when Emily Finn was in my group, she, you know, she has, she, she parcel, normalizes brains, parcels them. Uh, they look at difference between intelligence with, with that. And I thought, well, you know, how do you know, like, for instance, with all these parts, with all this normalization, so there must be error introduced, obviously, with, with normalization. And registration, and and then once you parcel it, you apply a standard parcelation. And my feeling is that there must be so much variation uh, among subjects uh, um, between subjects in in the the functional parcels where they're where they actually should be, where they're placed. And so there's all this averaging uh, within parcels that's mixing with all the other parcels. And and I thought, well, maybe that's enough to. To, to remove this effect uh, to some degree or reduce the correlations. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts on that. Um, uh, so, and so that's how it's different than GWAS in a sense, because it's sort of like a, an analog measure as opposed to a sort of a digital you know, mm. uh, genetic measure. Yeah, so I think this is where the, the distinction between <clears throat> reliability and validity comes back. Yep. Uh, so it can be very reliable, but how valid is it you know, to apply a group level parcellation to individual brains. I mean, we know from the Midnight Scan Club, you're going to get, you know, distorted features by doing that. Uh, so I think, you know, I think it's an excellent question. And I mean, the, the hope for me would be, yeah, if we had, you know, very reliable individual maps of every person and we knew which parcel in person one corresponded to parcel one and person two, that, you know, that would be a way to, to make the brain measure more valid and thus, you know, at least to some extent, boost effect sizes. Uh, hopefully, one day that's an empirical question, but I've, I don't know if, if we're there yet. I think we, we well, actually have I mean, a, oh, wait. oh, no, I was going to probably say the same thing as you, so I'll, I'll let you say it more eloquently, Damien. <laughs> no, 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 I was just going to say, we, based on that exact question, we actually have a, a paper out of my archive right now that's examining that by using the same data set that essentially, you know, we make a, a, a guess approximation of the individualized networks and then generate these probabilistic zones in the brain of like where these systems are likely to exist across all individuals or based on some percentage. 
And indeed, you can see with regard to, you can see increased reliability, uh, you know, within the systems relative to some of these, some of the outcome measures that we looked at in this, in this paper. But um, th at the end of the day, it's like, it's small. And, um, and so again, like, I don't think what, while that's certainly a thing, I just don't know how much it's going to buy you, you know, yeah. you know, it, Scott has this really awesome set of slides that I've stolen <laughs> um, that kind of walk through the concepts of sampling variability and, you know, what's causing, you know, and it's really, um, there's going to be a limit, you know, and so I think that's, it has to contribute to some degree, right, exactly yeah. what you say, but the question is, like, how much, and from what we've seen so far, at least um, in the work that we, because I, I was the first thing. I'm the same. Like I was, as soon as I started seeing the, the thing, I was like, okay, how am I going to beat when? I'm going to beat it. You know what I mean? I remember that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, you, and it's like, well, it's, it's, I'm not winning, you know? Um, so then it's like you've changed, you know, changed to kind of thinking through more about, you know, well, okay, in this context, you know, how do I answer that question, you know? And you, you know, so anyway. Yeah, and there's there's some work too on on nonlinear approaches to multivariate prediction that, that get at these, and you know, again, not to, to point out work that's not ours, but using the UK Biobank, and they actually end up returning pretty similar estimates of power and 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 and, and reproducibility. Um, obviously, the inference is different. I would also say to go back to the clinical piece it, it, at the extreme, I worry that 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 might even make things harder if the goal is diagnosis and screening, right? <laughs> right? If, it's, yeah. if I have to have my network to know whether I have depression and I have to have my specific parcellation, it's hard to imagine that being integrated in clinical care in a way that is um, sort of useful and, 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 um, and, and cost effective. Um, you know, if we have some central tendencies, if we can keep pushing these up and we have, you know, maybe they're not perfect, but at least we can get some prediction, then that seems more tenable to me than, than um, yeah, the sort of person specific piece, which, which again goes back to less about screening and more about process and a design of, of longitudinal over time. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm and, gonna, I'll say one thing, real, sorry. Yeah. Go on, go on. One, one thing real quick, because this comes up all the time and I'm, I think maybe you brought it up and Scott, Wrote a whole, we wrote a whole uh, supplemental section about it. Is the I think what are they calling a functional connectome fingerprint fingerprinting now? If you're using past data, right? Those are the studies where um, you know using some task working memory task, and then you can predict IQ really good in like 25 people. Right. Um, Scott and Brendan went through how that works. It's essentially that your task data, right? Uh, uh, carries a trace of the behavioral data. So if you're sort of cynical about it, it's like, yeah, I can uh, predict your IQ from your working memory subscore. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, I think- Oh, that's interesting. Randy, okay. You made Randy yeah. Buckner happy a lot, a lot by- better than the brain can. Yeah, but like yeah. you made Randy Buckner happy by citing his like 1990 something paper where, you know, they predicted on a person their, their memory performance off of scanner data, even with crude methods, right? Like even errors and stuff. So it's like when you scan someone, and you do fMRI and you treat it like fMRI, you actually have a track of their behavior. And so if they're correlated, which all the toolbox measures are correlated with each other. And so Scott showed and Brendan that if you regress that out, it sort of drops to the normal level, which Thomas Yeo has shown this, a bunch of people have shown this, Katerina Grattan, that if you treat task fMRI like rest, then the results are pretty much like rest, maybe your hair better. Um, yeah. So that's, that's sort of, it's like a special case. Um, yeah. Gets a little yeah. messy. Well, that's interesting. So it's sort of like, so you're trying, I mean, it, it, it's, there's a certain amount of circularity, uh, it, uh, not the same uh, as other people talk about, but yeah, certain uh, in terms of mesh, getting a behavioral measure from the fMRI, that sort of is indicated aside from some sort of connectivity measure or something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, well, that's interesting. So, but I mean, that brings us to, I mean, and actually just to illustrate uh, really quickly, uh, you know, once again, we have this Gulf that we're trying to connect of you know uh, several orders of magnitude of between doing you know interventional studies of you know, modulating something and seeing something or just seeing the effect versus getting deriving these effects. So any of these improvements might help a little bit, but I don't know if it's an overcome uh, enough to satisfy people to think oh they can just now do their you know twenty subjects again and uh, draw their comparisons. Um, 
what uh, along the lines of resting state though too. I, I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of wasted maybe time and you know uh, uh, in resting state where this brain is allowed to just idle. You know, uh, why not uh, do something like a litmus test and, and and sort of like Emily Finn has you know, kind of, you know talked about this a lot and other people Yuri Asan, you know, drive the brain with a movie and maybe come up with movies or tasks that pull apart differences more. But I, but I see what you're saying, Nico, that could also uh, suffer from that same effect of being driven by that and not by the brain effect. Um, what do you think of that? How do you think that might, I mean, certainly there's room to improve all these things and, and people jump to that and they think, oh, that might help a lot as far as that's concerned. All four movies and, and even tasks, mainly because I think the most important thing is that we got low motion data and that we keep, especially kids and patient populations in the scanner long enough to get a good measure and movies and even some tasks are great for that. Um, and, you know, coming from neurology, like when you're doing an EEG, you actually want awake, asleep and like strobe light, whatever. So you can kind of sample the brain across multiple states because in medicine often it is, even for something that is a state change, like where I'm having seizures, the trait is having epilepsy. Like you can have a seizure and you don't have epilepsy if you hit your head first, right? So a lot of medicine is about this trait. And so to me, it's like, if movie if, if it carries information task you're sleeping you do in the classical resting state like it's stored all together and see what your brain like what is the trait that 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 we're interested in uh so i'm not against movies at all now but i don't and i think they're better because they make people motivated to stay in the scanner and make you hold still slightly better but uh they're not gonna be magical you yeah. know uh, yeah i mean I, my, my i think the like when you you know again, have someone do a task in the scanner. So you're like, gonna like induce an effect and then predict something out of the scanner. You just have to be careful with what your interpretation of that is. Like in a, you know, for example, in a multivariate prediction, because you're loading your prediction by having them do something to then predict something out of the scanner. So if you're fine with that being your interpretation, that's okay. But if you wanna say that this is about the brain, yep. then I think you have to be very, very careful with with how you interpret that sort of prediction yeah yeah i mean my take on this and this is a, this is another one of the issues that i think that we have in our field is we often often the methods are driving the science right and it's really you know look i mean no matter what you're doing in the scanner these are just tools you know they're like i got a hammer i got a screwdriver you know okay you know well what are you trying to do you know you know i'm not letting the hammer or the screwdriver drive whether i'm building a, a you know building a house or you know like a, a dog house or something i i have a problem i have a thing that i i see which tools can i use to answer that question right yeah so i i really don't like the arguments of like don't use this use this don't use this it's like well what are you trying to figure out you know what yeah. is the question and then you kind of design your experiment around that. And it may be pure rest. It may be watching movies. It may be doing tasks. It could be whatever, you know, you know, so I, 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 I would rather folks focus on like the specifics and really dig in, really think hardy, hard about what they're trying to figure out and then say, okay, here are the tools I have at my disposal to help me figure that thing out. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Regarding tools, uh, and that's a really good question. I mean, just talking about MRI in general, though, uh, you know, there is, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, there are, you know, there is a neural correlate of, you know, of behavior. Um, and if the behavior is different a little bit, there is a, there is in, re, in the brain, a neural correlate. And, and fMRI or MRI um, uh, look at a very thin slice of, of spatial and temporal uh, resolution and contrast. And so, so maybe, you know, maybe it's at the level of circuitry, of individual circuitry, or, or, or maybe something, something else that we're not quite capturing in the temporal realm. Uh, uh, you know, we're hoping that it spills over to our spatial and temporal scale, but it, there's no guarantees. Um, maybe layer fMRI might pull something out, maybe. <laughs> so. Absolutely. I mean, that, absolutely. I mean, that's, we, we tend to, this is the thing I do, therefore, it must be able to do everything, you know, like, you know, that's, <laughs> that's how a lot of times we approach our work, you know, and, and our, and our, our things, you know, but it's, it's, you're totally right. It could be completely useless for that, yeah. you know, yeah. you know so. 
I feel like you learn a lot talking from sort of talking to other tribes in neuroscience. So like the genomicists, they're like, what are you complaining about? Your effect sizes are huge. <laughs> you know, like literally, like they're 10 times bigger than ours. Like you have it so easy. <laughs> and that's then, interesting. I, I think the thought is that it's for a different reason though. I think that with genomics, if people are thinking, oh, well, so many genes contribute in so many subtle ways, it's hard to pull something out. Whereas here, you're hoping that there's more of a collapsing of something that, i got a feeling that's going to be a wrong assumption too i mean just to be totally honest about the brain that there's a lot more contributions it's not so special you know like this circuit or that network than we think yeah and then i would say the ephys people you know the the macaque single unit physiologist they're like you're using bold why would you ever think that relates directly to behavior like you should be recording single unit spike trains and you know and then they have the papers where all the needs of one neuron to perfectly pre pre predict the entire monkey's behavior which steve peterson many of our mentors always like so what's the rest of the brain for if this one neuron is doing the whole job but you know like it's, it's the bold signal so i think that's totally valid i'm actually super happy about how well the bold signal does yeah, behavior because yeah. it could be worse. I think it could be much worse. It could yeah. be much and, worse. And I think the the temporal difference that that you point out, Peter, and this expanding. If we look at where fMRI does well, okay. it's when it's in the same time domain. It's predicting working memory of a task at the same time. That yep. you know, it, it, the challenge is going across this other level of these more distal outcome measures um, that are, by definition, psychiatric symptoms are just just defined across large timescales of weeks to months. For them to be a symptom that we care about, it has to be a long time scale. And, and so the, the success of fMRI, there's fantastic, you know, we talked about a bunch of papers where you can predict if it will be remembered or not. And it's clearly that is behavioral, behaviorally relevant. But I think, you know, driving the clarifying the goal of, of at what time scale are we trying to understand behavior is, is, is really a key to this uh, yeah. problem. Yeah. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. I mean, it's a complicated thing. I mean, without going too far into to wider topics, I mean, psychiatry in general. I mean, it's you know, it's not like uh, other medical disciplines. Um, not even even neurology. I mean, uh, it, whereas psychiatry, you know, you have complex behavior and many different reasons. And I'm I'm actually just reading this book by Tom Ensel uh, uh, on you know he was giving a talk on imaging and saying, this is great. And they're like, well, you know, my son has schizophrenia. How do you, how do you help them? And the, the goal in imaging is the thought, well, maybe you, you know the circuitry, you can just sort of fix it, either drug effects or, or modulate the circuitry. And like, it's becoming clear, it's very complicated and very, uh, it's a very, uh, you know, social problem. There's, there's a biologic problem. There's all kinds of issues and fMRI can only do so much as far as understanding it. And, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but back to your back to your uh, points, um, you know Emily Finn. Not to mention, keep on mentioning your name, but she actually brought up this really interesting effect with, when she was working on things. Is is what she calls the Anna Kar Karenina effect, where you know if your uh, normal subjects are sort of more similar, but if you're different, you're different in so many different ways, and it's very complicated to sort of track that or even characterize it. Um, um, one one other thing too, um, I, and I know, especially in the context of the the Midnight Scan Club, uh, one thought was that uh, that was mentioned was if you instead of having small amounts of data with a lot of subjects, you can get much further by having a huge amount of data with many fewer subjects. How, it's not it's not like a uh, an evenly balanced thing. What are your what are your thoughts on? you know, for the future of large databases, instead of just, you know, collecting 15 minutes or 20 minutes on a subject or an hour, collect, you know, a day's worth of data on many fewer subjects. None of this is an either or. It's yeah. always an and. Uh, I mostly like uh, the small end because uh, I have an aversion to complicated IRBs and paperwork and I'm probably just <laughs> too lazy and not good enough at meetings with 50 people that Damon can lead. You know, I just zone out. So I got to do the boutique stuff. That's all I got. But that doesn't mean it's any more valuable or important. It's, it's just totally different. I mean, I, people make fun of me for analogies, but the one I've been using lately, it's like you got a spade. It's great for digging holes. Like, don't try to eat your soup with it. It's all about what, what the tool is for. And you got to be really clean with that, you know? So, uh, you know, small end studies, this is a true story. For, for Evan Gordon's 2017 end of 10 first midnight scan paper, 
we were asked to correlate across the 10 subjects uh, against personality traits. And we had to write this whole long thing refusing, <laughs> 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 saying that the effect size would have to be the biggest effect on the planet ever seen to be valid in 10 people. And, and it was a reviewer who just wanted to know. And, and it was kind of like, yeah, that, wouldn't that be cool? And you have to be like very disciplined to be like, no, you cannot do that, you know? Uh, so so yeah. it's almost like, and it's also this like weird arrogance that I think we, comes up, I'm not excluding myself, you know, we're like, oh, I know the best way. I, I was like, we don't, like all my hypotheses are wrong, including about what's the best way to do anything. So, so you should have multiple paths and like, it's all good. Like we wrote in a sentence in a paper, there's no correct size, sample size for imaging studies. Like we mean that. Yeah. It's just literally like eat your soup with a spoon, dig a hole in your yard with a spade. Like just don't, like, like what Damien was saying is like, this sort of like, I'm a hammer person. So I'm hammering everything. That, that's, that's the wrong approach, you know, I think. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think this question in general speaks to the power of fMRI. We, we don't have this issue if fMRI is only useful for one type of study design. I think it speaks to the power of, you know, its utility in a bunch of different study designs. But then the onus is on us as researchers to take care of that and to really think critically about the study designs and know when to use a spoon and, you know, know when to use a bigger tool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually, right. And I think the field is maturing. I think that uh, you have researchers who, you know, had the hope that you could, you could answer the questions you're trying to answer with with you know small n, but you need larger n. And there's different questions and different interventions that you can do uh, that are very clinically useful. Uh, that with you know you can do with individual subjects or small n's. It's just you know even guiding, for instance, neuromodulation. You you create an activation. You look at the network and you try to do neuromodulation. That that could be incredibly useful. Exactly. <laughs> so, yep. yep. To be I love clear, that. Uh, if you know anyone that's going to fund a day's worth of uh, resting state data on 10,000 participants, I'd, I'd definitely be interested <laughs> in that data. <laughs> I tried to do that, actually. Do you remember, actually, Peter, was it, remember at the beginning of the, when we were talking with Nora and everybody about how much data we can collect for rest, me and BJ, yes. had to pull you, in as a, you were the, you know, the consultant yeah. who helped us get it. We were, I was trying to push for like 30, 40 minutes, you know, right. this is why, you know, and then <laughs> You kind of compromised that 20, you know? But yeah, that's right. Two, two runs of 10. Uh, yeah, I should still participate. I keep on getting invites for the ABCD uh, projects, and I'm not sure whether I'd be helpful or not for just consulting or whatever, but still, either yeah. way. Um, yeah, so you, 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 I thank you for that, because people are trying to push that down to like five, and I was like, no! Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, but it is kind of interesting. There's an argue that, yeah, if you do, if you do less and less, there'll be more somehow it, it's not the same as, you know, doing five minutes uh, is not the same as doing 20 minutes, uh, you know, and, and having less subjects. It's, it seems better to do longer uh, uh, as much to a certain point and then doing less. Exactly. Subjects. Yeah. yeah. Now, first yeah, of all, I love, I love that Scott couldn't think of another tool outside of spoon. That was like, that was <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that, you know, there's a couple, there's other, a couple of big things that came up in this last conversation, I think is important. And you mentioned like all the different authors and stuff in this paper. I think the other big message that comes out of this work is that, is that this is, a, this is a, this is an all in all hands on deck community enterprise, right? You need a lot of people, a lot of different ideas at the table. This is not going to be your boutique lab anymore, kind of doing everything all, I do it myself, you know, kind of mentality, you know? Yeah, you know, so that kind of leads to like the importance of open science and better standard standards, and you know, people kind of collaborating, and even the funding mechanisms and things you know around around this new kind of world. I think it's really important that you that all of our infrastructure and our and our culture changes so we can maximize the potential. You know, yeah, and I think yeah. Brendan and Scott's ability to essentially bring on board, you know, all these, this huge, you know, across, lots of labs, lots of different people, all the different brains, you know, different resources that kind of come together to do something this large and important, I think speaks to the, is a testament to kind of the future, like what, what we need to do as a, as a field to move forward and move forward more quickly. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a, it's a really, really nice sort of just uh, lens that's, that, forces people to look at fMRI 
uh, what it's good for, what it's not, and what it can be done. And I know that some, you know, some people are worried about, uh, you know, funders, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, what would you tell, uh, you know, NIH people or even private foundations or whatever that are kind of nervous when they read this paper, like, is it, you know, obviously you try to educate them on the various aspects of fMRI, but, <laughs> and the, and well, the, and the, well, and Josh this. Gordon asked me, asked me that question. I told them we need more money. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and actually, no, but, but I think that your point that you made earlier about epidemiology is a really good one. I think there's a real value to those studies, uh, yeah. and and that maybe that should be emphasized with these. Yeah, and same with genomics. You know, it's like the, these fields have been there before, been where we are before, and and they still get funded. There's still a lot of utility. We have that, and we can do population neuroscience. Plus, we have the additional. All these other cool things we can do with the brain by perturbing the system. So, I mean, I would argue that our road ahead is easier uh, than than their roads were. So, I mean, that it's the reason why, and it's it's true. We've never been more optimistic for the field of neuroimaging. You know, we know where we've been, and I think after chewing on this for three years, we've got a very clear, you know, lens through which to look where we need to go. I think we've got a, a really good idea of that, and a lot of that is what we've been talking about here. Yeah. And how cool is that? that? That it's like we have a phrase now of population neuroscience. Like we as neuroimagers can sp start to speak at the language of epidemiology. Like that, what an awesome time to be a scientist, in my opinion. And I, I and so I think for funders, um, I'll let you know how it goes. I got a couple grants pending, but I think establishing that language of differences, there is epidemiology and there are clinical trials and in, in interventional medicine. Like yep. if we can build that language up, that, that goes a long way, I think, um, to, to these questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, all right. Well, um, uh, just, to, just to wrap up a little bit, is there anything, I mean, we covered a lot of ground. I think hopefully we clarified the implications of this paper and the different types of fMRI for, you know, many people, general audiences and, and whatnot. But um, is there anything more you wanted to say? Uh, uh, yeah, but aside from that, I thanks for, for coming. But is there anything more you wanted to uh, uh, add to this as well? Yeah, what I want to say is because I've seen this a lot, this sort of for junior people, you know, they're like, well, I can't, you know, be running a consortium. I don't have the CV for it. Uh, you can download the data. Right. And and you can do the sort of small and more like, you know, macaque electrophysiology type of studies. You know, they just showed that if you you're pretty well powered with two monkeys and with three, you're golden. Um, you know, the movie stuff, uh, you know, often it's just one, two, three subjects and in jack o is is like I'm repeating the experiment. So there are lots of things to do. Uh, don't despair. And uh, the, the reports of the death of fMRI have been greatly exaggerated. The patient's alive and well. You know. I'll, yeah, I add, I'll add one for the older investigators is that is like the, you know, is that, it, it, you know, fighting back, you know, fighting back against something, even though you kind of know to be true, can sometimes will slow, will slow us down. And the reality is we're a pretty creative bunch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as soon as we understand the problem, you best believe there's going to be a solution before too long, because once we put our mind to it as a field, we nail it and it ha it's like you see it over and over and over again so i i don't this is not this is this is this is far from being a problem this is this is not a bug this is a feature you know and that's going to accelerate our, our our accelerate our science by by a lot as long as we really pay attention to it yeah well that's great i think yeah and i agree as we grapple with this we we learn more about you know the brain itself and, and how these things are manifest. And so it's just information that we're getting uh, that, you know, to keep on improving our understanding, hopefully clinical implications in, in various scales in various ways. And, um, but definitely fMRI has, has uh, many, many ways of being done and, and many things that still they'll probably uncover. But uh, all right, well, well thanks again. Uh, uh, all of you, uh, this was a great discussion, and I think it really will help the field in general. So, so I appreciate it. Hope so, certainly. Thanks for doing it. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This week's episode was produced by Niels Mullert and Kevin Seatek. <laughs>